Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25 is the scripture for our message. We want to think this morning about the fact that Jesus came to save us from our sins. <coughs> that beautiful baby in a manger, you know, so innocent. We just th think of Christmas as just that baby in a manger and all the things about that. And we may not want to think about the more serious aspects of of what we have to relate to the Christmas story because you can't have the Christmas story without the Easter message. One without the other is, uh, is not complete. Jesus was not just the babe of Bethlehem. He was the Lamb of God who died on the cross for our sins. And it's in the Christmas story as well in this passage in Matthew chapter 1. So I'm just going to read a few verses from it chapter beginning with verse 18 says this is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about his mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph but before they came together she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit because Joseph her husband was a righteous man he did not want to expose her to public disgrace he had in mind to divorce her quietly now, they weren't really married yet because this was what we would call the engagement period. And, of course, during that engagement period, uh, there was no sexual intimate relationship that was, that was permissible. That would have been immoral. And so that's the, the reason Mary was so troubled and Joseph also. But note that it says that it was, it was before they came together in any kind of intimate way. She was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. That's, we believe in the virgin birth. She was a virgin, and yet she was able to have a child because of the miraculous power of the Holy Spirit. So it goes on in verse 20, say, But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. I'm going to stop right there. The rest of, the, of that scripture reading is, is listed there in your bulletin and you can read it later if you'd like to. But I want to stop right there because I want to get into the message because we're also going to have communion this morning. And I would remind you that communion is open to all who are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. If your heart is right with Him and you're serving Him today, you are a believer, you don't have to be a member of this church to take communion. You can receive the communion uh, without being a member, but you need to be a believer. You need to be trusting in Jesus Christ as your Savior. So it tells us that He, he would have the name Jesus because... He will save his people from their sins. In December of 1903, after many attempts, the Wright brothers were successful in getting their flying machine off the ground. They were so thrilled that they telegraphed this message to their sister Catherine. They said, we have actually flown 120 feet will be home for Christmas. She hurried down to the editor of the local newspaper and she handed the note to him and he read it. But the only thing that he noticed was that it said they would be home for Christmas. He said, oh great, the boys will be home for Christmas. He had missed what they would have thought was the most important part of that telegraphed message. That they had flown a plane 120 feet. That doesn't sound like anything to us nowadays, but it was something to them. How many people today miss the real meaning of Christmas for something else? Something that's not nearly as important. Presents, lights, all the bells and whistles at Christmas, all of the beautiful things, all of the decorations, all of the busyness of the season, all of the, the different kinds of uh, things that we enjoy eating at Christmas time, and that's one of the things we enjoy the most about it, isn't it? Now admit it. That's what he's to eat. That's right. He admitted it, and the rest of us would probably do the same. That's right, we like to eat. And I hope you'll all come this evening for our, for our all Christmas dinner at 5 o'clock. But I hope that you don't miss the real meaning of Christmas, and I don't think you do, but a lot of people in this old world do. 
And a lot of people are certainly trying to take Christ out of Christmas. They don't want the manger scene in any kind of public setting. They don't even want a Christmas tree. You know, if you just say the word Christmas, you're saying something about the real meaning of it. Because the 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 title, the, just the the name Christmas, means the celebration of Christ. So if we celebrate giving gifts and eating big meals and getting a day off work and all the other things that that we enjoy at Christmas time, but we don't celebrate Christ, we miss something. And so this morning I want us especially to think about the fact that Jesus came to save us from our sins. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. The New Testament name Jesus is the equivalent of the Old Testament name Joshua, which means salvation. And so Jesus had that name because he will save his people from their sins, she was told. The first thing is that Jesus wants to save us from the condemnation of sin. Condemnation of sin. Sin has the power to send us to hell. Sin has the power to send us to hell. That's a serious thing, isn't it? Matthew 10, 28, Jesus said, Do not be afraid of those who kill the body. They cannot kill the soul. Nobody can kill your spirit. They can't take away your relationship with Jesus Christ. Somebody can put a gun to your head and they, and they, can, they can kill you. They can take your life, your physical life away from you, but no one can take away your relationship with Jesus Christ. They can't take away your spiritual life. So Jesus said, don't be afraid of the one who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. That's what you should be afraid of. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. We all know what wages are, right? Did you get paid? If you work, you probably did. Maybe you get paid every week. Maybe you get paid every other week, like my wife does. Maybe you get paid once a month. Maybe you get paid when you do work, and maybe you're not doing any. I don't know, but wages are what we get when we work. But gift, a gift is something different. So the Bible says the wages of sin is death. That's what we've earned. But the gift of God is what? Eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So that's a gift. You don't earn it. You don't work for it. But wages are something you earn because you work for them. What you have earned, what we have all earned, by the fact that we were born with a sinful heart and from, from the very beginning... Doesn't take very long to see that that carnal spirit in a little baby. I know we don't want to see it, and and you look at your precious little child or grandchild, and maybe you don't see it, but you will pretty soon if you're realistic and if you're honest, you'll see it. It's there even in children. We're all sinners. We all lied, cheated, did different things to sin against God's word, and so the Bible says our wages. The wages of sin is death. What we have earned by, by committing sins is death. And death doesn't just mean physical death. It means separation from God. And it ultimately means separation from God in hell. But Jesus came to forgive our sins and to give us eternal life. Amen? Amen. Jesus came to forgive our sins and to give us eternal life. John 3, 16 and 17 says, For God so loved the world... That means the people in the world. It means you. It means me. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, Jesus, whose birth we celebrate now, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And then he went on to say, For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. You know, fear of condemnation is a tremendous load for anyone to carry. One time I was out riding my motorcycle with a friend. It was uh, it was right around Christmas time. But this has been many many years ago, over over twenty over thirty years ago I guess. 
and we were in a store and I reached to get my wallet because I was going to buy something and I didn't have my wallet. It had fallen out of my pocket at home. I thought about maybe calling my wife to get her to bring it to me or doing something else, but I thought, well, I can surely get home without that wallet. I'll be all right without my driver's license. We pulled out of there and started down the road, and it was a one-way road, and it went over the crest of a hill, and the policemen were on both sides, and they were stopping people to check for their licenses <laughs> and their insurance. And I couldn't turn around. I couldn't do anything. It was too late. I explained to them. I said, I, I have a driver's license. It's a valid driver's license, but I just don't have it with me because it fell out of my pocket. Well, the guy said, even if you went back home and got it, I'd still have to give you a ticket. Now, I don't know if that was true or not, but that's what he said. I don't think he would have had to, but he, but he, he said that anyway, and he did give me a ticket. So I went down to the, to the city hall, and um, I can't remember, city hall or the county courthouse. I went, and I showed them my license, and I said, I got this ticket, and the lady said, oh, that's all right, we'll take care of it, it's not, you, don't have to, you won't have to pay a fine, you just needed to show me that you had a valid license, and so I thought it was all taken care of. So in a few weeks, I went to the evangelism conference in Oklahoma City, and somebody tried to call from the courthouse while I was gone, and um, I got a message, I got a personal call then, later on, and the lady said, uh, you are in contempt of court. What? What did I do wrong? You didn't show up for the court date for your tickets that you got for not having your driver's license with you. I said, well, that was, I went down and that was all taken care of. She said, well, I don't have any record of that. So things were getting really uh, thick. The plot was really thickening. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I thought I'd taken care of it, but I went to the wrong place. It was a city ticket, and I went to the county, or the other way around. Anyway, I went to the wrong place, and I thought it was taken care of, but it wasn't. And they said I was in contempt of court. So I had to go. I said, well, I need to see the judge, don't I? Yes, you do. I said, well, can't I take care of this over the phone? No, you can't. And uh, so I had to go down and see the judge, and I was the very last one. I had to sit there in the court uh, in the courtroom until everybody else was done, because I just was... It wasn't my time to go there. I just went down there because I better get down there because I was in contempt of court. So I'd sit there until everybody else got through, and I'm sitting there trying to figure out just what I'm going to say to the judge. And when I got up there and tried to explain it to him, I think he was so, it was so confusing to him that uh, finally he just said, well, I'll drop the charges. It's, that's it. That's, that's okay. So I didn't have to pay a fine. But I'll tell you, for that length of time between the time the lady called and said I was in contempt of court until the time I finally got to stand before that judge and explain the situation, I was worried. Condemnation is a terrible thing. The fear of condemnation is a terrible thing. When I was in high school, I was walking down the hall with one of my, one of my friends, and uh, we were just shoving each other back and forth at noon time. It was, it, we just had some extra time after lunch before the next class started. And we were just kind of walking down the hall, pushing each other back and forth. And all of a sudden, I gave him a big push. And uh, he gave me a big push. And then I gave him a bigger push. And he went right into the trophy case window. And all, and all of a sudden, all the glass came, came down. It just made the terriblest noise. There weren't any carpets in the halls. This was one of those old schools with the real high ceilings and the, and the tile floor. And I mean, you could probably hear it for miles around. I don't know. But it was right next to the superintendent's office, too. And he came out and dragged us into his office. And whoa, man, we got the third degree. And he told us that uh, we, were not, we weren't going to even graduate from high school until that was paid for. And I didn't know how I was going to pay for that. And... Uh, and my parents didn't have the money to pay for it with seven kids. And I was only a sophomore. And two more years went by, and we never paid for it, and nothing else was said about it. But I just could imagine that when it came time for graduation, they were going to say, you can't graduate. You never paid that bill you owe for the trophy case window that you broke. Nothing ever came of it. I never had to pay. But there was a condemnation hanging over my head that bothered me for a long time. It still does. No, it doesn't anymore. <laughs> uh, but the thing is, 
that was material things. That was a person telling me that I was going to have to pay for something, and I guess they were just trying to scare us. Maybe the insurance paid for it, school's insurance. I don't know. But I do know one thing. When we really stand before the judge of all the earth, there won't be any exceptions. That's right. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. What we have earned. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus came to save us from the condemnation of sin. It's called pardoning. It's called justification. We all need justification. We all need pardoning. But we need more. And so the second thing is Jesus wants to save you from the control of sin as well as the condemnation of sin. He wants to save you from the power of sin. So when the Bible says His name will be Jesus because He will save us from our sins, it's not just talking about justification and pardoning. It's not just about talking about saving us from the condemnation of sin. It's talking about saving us from the power of sin, from the control of sin. As we've said, we are all sinners at birth. David said in the, in the 51st Psalm, verse 5, Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. I know this morning in the adult class they were talking about Isaiah 53, where it talks about all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his, to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And that's beautiful passage in the 53rd chapter of Isaiah is a passage that talks about the fact that Jesus took all of our sin upon himself. That he carried our sin to the cross. But it was written so many years before he ever came. I'm glad that you had that for the Sunday school lesson this morning because it goes along with our service this morning and with having communion. But Jesus not only wants to save us from the condemnation of sin, not only pardon us, He wants to regenerate us. He wants to make a change in our hearts. He wants to change us. He wants to save us from the power of sin. We were all under the control of sin's power. Romans 7, 14 to 18 says, We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual. Soul is a slave to sin. Did you know that? Before you come to Jesus, you are a slave to sin. You may say, you may make a New Year's resolution this year that you're going to stop doing something that you've been doing that you think is wrong and that probably is wrong, but you don't have the power to stop doing it. And most New Year's resolutions don't last very long, do they? Have you ever made a New Year's resolution? They usually get forgotten about pretty soon. They don't last. We need more than a New Year's resolution. We need a new heart. We need Jesus to come and change us from, in, from the inside out. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, it says in Romans 3.23. And then it goes on to say in this 7th chapter of Romans, not only that we know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, soul is a slave to sin. <laughs> it goes on to say, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. Have you ever felt like that? And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. In other words, you recognize that you're doing something wrong. You don't want to do it, but you can't stop doing it, he says. Even I, and if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. Because you were born with that. I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. That's how the person feels who's never come to know Jesus Christ as a Savior. And even after people have come to know Him, until they are filled with and controlled by the Holy Spirit, you have those times when you feel like you cannot control what's going on. And you say, I can't stop this or I can't stop that. And I want to do what's right, but I can't. Have you ever felt that way? We probably all have felt that way if we're, if we're going to be honest this morning. We can all be redeemed, however, from sin's power over us. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, and I've quoted this so many times, you can probably all quote it with me. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. 
The old has gone, the new has come. Now that's talking about something more than pardon. That's ta talking about something more than justification. That's talking about regeneration. That's talking about sanctification. That's talking about what takes place in the heart of the believer when he, really, he or she really comes to know Jesus as his or her Savior. When you accept the Lord, He does more than pardon you. He wants to change you. He wants to give you something to help you to be able to live a life with, but, but to say no to sin, no to the things that are wrong. You don't have to sin every day and confess every night. Of course, if you sin every day, you need to confess every night. But you don't have to sin every day because Jesus can help you to say no to things that are wrong. And He wants to. So, the, so not only does Jesus want to save us from the condemnation of sin, but from the control of sin, from the power of sin. We can all be redeemed from sin's power over us. As I pointed out, the, the, the Scripture says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. Many years ago, there was a, there was a, uh, a lawyer in St. Louis who visited a, a Christian to transact some business. And before the two parted, his client said to him, I've often wanted to ask you a question, but I've been afraid to do so. What do you want to know? Asked the lawyer. The man replied, I've wondered why you're not a Christian. The man hung his head. He said, I know enough about the Bible to realize that it says that no drunkard can enter the kingdom of God, and you know my weakness. Truthfully, I can't recall anyone ever explaining how to become a Christian. That's what the lawyer said. And so this man picked up his Bible. The client read some passages showing that all are under condemnation, but that Christ came to save the lost by dying on the cross for their sins. And by receiving him as your substitute and redeemer, he said, you can be forgiven. If you're willing to receive Jesus, let's pray together. That's what he said to this lawyer. And the lawyer agreed. And when it was his turn, the lawyer prayed and he said this, Oh Jesus, I'm a slave to drink. One of your servants has shown me how to be saved. Oh God, forgive my sins and help me overcome the, the power of this terrible habit in my life. And he did. And you know who that lawyer was? He was C.I. Schofield, who later edited the reference Bible that bears his name. You've probably all heard of the Schofield Bible. That man who was a lawyer and a drunkard had not heard the gospel from anyone in that kind of a personal way. But when he heard it and when he prayed, God not only forgave him and saved him from the condemnation of sin, but from the control of sin. He wasn't a drunkard anymore. He gave up the, his, his liquor. He gave up his alcohol. And he, and he gave up his sins. That doesn't mean he never committed any more sins. That means that he, that he was still had the possibility of sin in his life, but he, had, but he now had a new power to say no to things that were wrong in his life too. So when you come to Jesus, it doesn't mean that you're not going to be tempted anymore. It doesn't mean that you that you can't sin. But it does mean that you can say no to sin. Isn't, isn't that great? That yeah. through Jesus Christ, yeah. you can have the power to say no to things that God shows you that are wrong. And if you do fall back into sin, you can ask forgiveness and you can have cleansing and forgiveness. John 8, 11 uh, is is something that Jesus said to the woman that was caught in the very act of adultery. Do you remember the story in the Bible? They were about to stone her. They dragged this woman to Jesus. They said, we caught this woman in the very act of adultery. And the law of Moses says that she should be stoned. Now what do you say? They were trying to trick Jesus. They were trying to catch him saying something against the law of Moses. They were trying to, to get him to condemn him. And you remember the story, how he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And he said, he who was without sin can cast the first stone. 
And then he stooped down and wrote in the ground. And then he looked. And pretty soon, it says, from the first to the last, they all left. I don't know what he was writing on the ground. Somebody said, suggested maybe he was writing their sins on the ground. <laughs> because God knows everything. And maybe he was writing some of their sins down there. And so they left. And then he looked up at the woman and he said, where are your accusers? And she said, there aren't any. And he said, neither do I condemn you. But he didn't stop there. He said something else. You know what else he said? Go and sin no more. So he was telling her, leave your life of sin. When you come to know Jesus, he, gives, he comes into your heart and he makes you a new person. And he not only saves you from the condemnation of sin, but from the control of sin, from the power of sin. And so God is able to do for us the same thing that he did for, for Schofield, the writer of the Schofield Bible, the, the one who gave us that reference Bible. This attorney who was a drunkard, God saved him and changed his life. And he can do the same for anyone who will turn to him. In Luke 9, 23, it says, Jesus said to them all, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. To be a Christian, you need to believe in Jesus. To be a believer, you need to trust him. Not just believe in your head, but trust in him. And ask him to forgive your sins. And ask Jesus to come into your heart. In Revelation 3.20, Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And I think the door he's talking about is the door of our lives, the door of our hearts. He said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone will hear my voice and open the door, I will come in. And he says he will fellowship with him, and we can fellowship and have wonderful fellowship with, with the Lord. To know him personally. That's what it means to be a believer, to be a Christian. And I hope... Everyone here this morning has that experience. But if you don't, I invite you this Christmas season to discover what Christmas is really all about. And not just to know about Jesus, but to know Him as your personal Savior.